Words are about to be spoken on the extreme life of Matt Hardy, brought to you by the ad-free shows and podcasts. Heat Networks, I'm John Alba. That's the broken one, the woken one, the spoken one himself. Mr. Matt Hardy, what's going on, my man? Doing great, man. Uh, hanging out. Took uh, my ice bath a little bit later than normal today. I just finished it up, so I'm like feeling euphoric from getting out of it. Also a little chilly. Got my socks on, but it's all good. Should uh should keep me very uh on my toes throughout today's podcast. Frozen toes, keeping you on your toes. I like it either way. It was great seeing you this week at the TNA tapings in Philadelphia at the 2300 Arena. I got to spend some time backstage at TNA. I appreciate the hospitality from them. And more importantly, man, just to see the Hardys get the love that they did at the 2300 Arena this Will not have aired yet, but when Matt and Jeff make their in-ring return, you guys are going to be blown away by that reception that they got. What was the taping weekend like for you, man? Good. Uh, very busy weekend, all weekend. A lot a lot of stuff crammed in, packed into those, those two days of taping TV. So uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm very excited now that people have seen the match with myself and, uh, and Rebby. It was, uh, it was one of those things that she was just so nervous about it. And still, after doing it, when I told her it was good, uh, she was still worried about how it was going to turn out on TV and what people's opinion of her returning to the ring was and whatnot. But she, she did great. She, uh, she worked really hard. She was super nervous going in, and uh, I, 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 she just, she is such a perfectionist and someone who has such high expectations of of everyone, especially herself, probably more than you know, more than everyone else. So uh, it, it was good. And uh, regardless of what she says about it, I won't let her think otherwise. It was, <laughs> it was really good, and she did good. Yeah, I'm excited to see that match. That has aired as we record this, or as we air this, I should say. But that reception that you and Jeff got, you posted a little social media teaser of it. Uh, man, Philadelphia became hardy country, man. It really felt amazing being in the building for that. How how did it feel to be back in there with Jeff? We're not going to spoil anything or any of the results, but how how did it feel getting a chance to be back out there with him? Uh, it, it was great, man. It, it's uh, you know, it's just it's it's instinct at this point. I mean, we're we're brothers. We're on the same page. We know we know what we're doing. And I just got to say, I was just putting you over. Just so you know, I just put you over huge. I don't believe that for a second. I certainly did. <laughs> you did huh? Put you over huge okay. because the match has aired and you did great. Oh I said, God. regardless of what you think, I'm not going to let you believe differently. You did great and you killed it. Uh, okay. So that that is Rebby. She's popping her head in here, working. Um, yeah, but just uh, with Jeff, man, it's just uh, it, you know, it it just feels right. Whenever we're out there and we're doing our thing together as Matt and Jeff Hardy is two brothers who ran down a dream that they both really aspired to do when they were young and they were able to, to get a hold of it and they were able to turn into something very special uh, to still be able to do that. That's both what we want to be doing. And it was great that we just went out as a tag team and we got that reception and we had the match we had and, and we did what we did and Philadelphia was off the charts. Thank you, Philly. Always, uh, always been a big fan of Philly even though, you know, there's a lot of people that say, like, uh, it's a big hill town. And it's just because the wrestling fans there are so smart. They're so passionate. And uh, they showed us so much love. The meet and greet afterwards, it took us almost two hours to cut through the hundreds of people that came and did the post-show meet and greet. So thank you guys for hanging out and waiting on us. So uh, it, it was it was a great day at the office for Matt and Jeff Hardy. And, uh, and we're really excited about what the future holds. Yeah, Mama and I went and found a dive bar after the show. And I, I, I was told she sent you a... Uh, send you a video of, <laughs> of us out there it was a great time man we we really love philadelphia it's such a great wrestling city as matt said and any chance you get to see the hardys do their thing that's where you want to be and that's why you want to be in atlantic city july 13th we are just a week away from 90s wrestling con it's a hardy party a night with the hardys at ACX1 Studios at the Pier at Caesars in Atlantic City. Tickets just $60 for a dual live show, hardyboyslive.com. That's boys with a Z, hardyboyslive.com. First time ever double event. Matt's going to be sharing stories from the Attitude Era as part of a live edition of the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, followed 
by a Brother Nero Jeff Hardy concert. And Matt, this is not going to be something a diehard Hardy fan is going to want to miss, is it? Oh, if you are a Die Hardy fan of Matt and Jeff, uh, you definitely do not want to miss this. You know, on top of earlier that day, all, sa- all Saturday, we're going to be doing a meet, greet, and delete. And then that evening, the uh, festivities really heat up because I'm doing a lo- live podcast. Myself, John, will be there doing a live podcast. And we're going to be talking about all about the Attitude Era. We're going to be talking about stories. I'm going to be answering questions. Whatever you want to know, I am going to tell you. And then following that, you get to see Jeff do a concert. Uh, he's going to be doing originals. He'll be doing some covers. He'll be doing everything he can to entertain you to the best of his ability. And it's really unique seeing Jeff in this light because it's something that he is truly so passionate for. The way he is passionate for his music and his performances right now remind me of when we were just getting into the business in the mid-90s, when we were really you know, grinding really hard to make it. That's kind of where he is with his music right now. So it's really special. And you're, you're catching him at a special time in his life. I got a chance to be up close and in person backstage this week. Rich Swan had his guitar backstage, and he started ripping some Pearl Jam. He started singing Even Flow, and Jeff just spontaneously, instinctively joined in with him, and it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen, and you're going to get a chance to see Jeff on stage doing this thing uh, alongside our podcast. Again, tickets are $60. at Saturday, July 13th at 6 p.m., It is a hearty party and night with the Hardys. Our live events are some of the best value live events in all of professional wrestling. And now you're getting two for the price of one. So I'm so excited for you guys to be part of it. Jersey is my home state. Atlantic City kind of ties in with that Philadelphia market too. So if you had a chance to check out the TNA tapings and you enjoyed what you saw, come on out for this. Matt's going to be telling stories that I don't think we've gone into on the podcast because we're really going to be owning in on the Attitude Era and some of the crazy characters from the Attitude Era, like the Godfather and the Headbangers and APA and all these great characters that, Matt, I'm sure you have no doubt plenty of stories about. So I'm very, very excited. Any teasers you can give us about some of that? No doubt. I mean, all, all those guys, I have great stories surrounding all of those guys, uh, especially especially the Headbangers because they... Uh, you know, we met them at Smoky Mountain. We knew them, and uh, I was only 24 at the time. I couldn't always uh, get a rental car because you were technically supposed to be 25, especially because the company was giving me a voucher because it was part of our developmental deal agreement. So those guys kind of uh, took us under their wing, and they would get the cars and drive us around. So we uh, we learned a, a lot from the headbangers, I guess, both good and bad. So we're going to have some fun stories about those guys. Going to be great. HardyBoysLive.com. So... Make sure you check that out. $60 tickets. We would love to see you there. The words will, in fact, be spoken. The words are going to be spoken over the course of this podcast, Matt, because in just a little bit, with Money in the Bank weekend uh, upon us here, we're going to go and watch your first Money in the Bank ladder match, which was from WrestleMania 22. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since we've gotten into the career of Matt Hardy. We've taken a little bit of a detour but I'm excited to talk about a period of time we haven't spent too much time discussing. That's coming up in just a little bit on this podcast. Money in the Bank is this weekend, Matt. I guess I'll ask you right off the bat uh, for some picks here because we love making our predictions on the extreme life. Uh, Jay Uso, Carmelo Hayes, Andrade, Chad Gable, L.A. Knight, and Drew McIntyre in the men's Money in the Bank match. Boy, that's an all-star Money in the Bank lineup if I've ever heard one, and I don't think it's one that's particularly very easy to pick. But if you had to pick between Jay, Mello, Andrade, Gable, L.A. Knight, and Drew, who are you going with? I think uh, I'm going to go with Drew for this one just because of of the circumstances that has uh, surrounded him kind of uh being caught up in the money in the bank and, and ended up dropping his title the whole deal with punk and him at, him at mania so I, i'm gonna go with drew i think drew would be a very interesting character in that role yeah he certainly would be have you been paying attention to jay uso's entrances that he's been getting and that connection with the crowd that he's been forming yes very much so what do you think about all that uh i, I mean I, I think that is what is good for business and that is what is that that's what makes people emotionally connect with the character and he's definitely emotionally connecting with the character and he's doing even a more tremendous job because him and the usos got over you know him and his brother got over so so well on on their own as a tag team and, it, and it's hard whenever you break and try and find that single identity to really 
uh, grab that audience and 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 be able to captivate them. And he has done that. And this entrance is something that just ties in with them. And and there really is a strong commotion, uh, a strong emotional connection with uh, the main event, Jay, Jay Uso, right now. And I'm I'm here for it. And the crowds are just so much more invested, right? WWE crowds are loud crowds right now. Why why do you think that has changed over time? Because not that long ago, we're seeing a very different dynamic. What? Why is the crowd louder? But yeah, like why? Because I mean, that's everyone who watches WWE right now. That's the first they're talking about how hot the crowds are, how hot the crowds are. They're putting more butts in seats than ever, like in in the last fifteen years. Where is that stemming from, in your opinion? I mean, I just think from a story storyline perspective and from a storyline stance, I think right now their their game is the strongest it's been in in years. Uh, you know, I think starting at the top from the bloodline stuff and even the stuff the bloodline is still currently doing is it's morphing and changing and you're getting ready to have a bloodline versus bloodline or whatever it may be. Uh, the stuff with Cody, uh, everything underneath is just really strong. Their storytelling is really strong and, and they're focusing on making these emotional connections with the characters in the audience. And I think they're doing a great job with that. And that at the end of the day is what makes you successful more than anything else. And, and that's really what they're owning in on. Yeah, seeing Jay's entrances and just how you got 20,000 people bobbing the lights up and down is, is unbelievable uh, as a visual. I like your Drew McIntyre pick. I would say he's probably the favorite to win this. From a storyline dynamic perspective, it would definitely keep things pretty interesting as you head towards SummerSlam with CM Punk. And, and I also do think Gable would be interesting too. Just, just Gable, would, Gable would be very... I think all these guys in it would be very interesting for the record. I wouldn't hate if this is the first time we see Drew McIntyre get one on Punk, maybe Punk tries to screw him and McIntyre finally gets one up and wins money in the bank. You know, it's time for Drew uh, who yes. took Punk out to keep one upping him to even those scores a little bit. But with Punk seemingly out after Drew took him out, I think that you could very well see Drew in my, my sleeper pick would be mellow. And I think it would be great to see investing in the young talent, giving him that opportunity right away. But I've got thoughts on that in just a second as we get to the woman's side, which is EO Sky, Chelsea Green, Lyra Valkyria, Tiffany Strand, Naomi, and Zoe Stark. Because, Matt, in this side, I'm going with Tiffany Strand, who I believe uh, they view as the anchor of the women's division for many years to come in the not-so-distant future. And what better way to launch someone than by giving them an opportunity like this to elevate into a main event picture. What do you think about that idea? That, that's, that would be my pick as well. Yeah. Tiffany Stratton would be my pick also. Just the idea of taking someone who's largely new to the main roster and telling your crowd she's important because she won this. I, I think that kind of connects well with the money in the bank concept that we're going to talk a little bit about here. Uh, in this episode of The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Uh, since we're on the WWE front, we keep talking about it every week, but I know this is something that you're just so incredibly entranced with. We saw another one of those Bo <coughs> Dallas, Uncle Howdy vignettes where the layers were pulled back even more on what's going on with this Wyatt Six. What do you think about this week's vignette? I, I enjoyed it. I, I love the way they set everything up with you had Gable uh, and he realized that the white six were coming for him and he started heading out and then he saw the people and it was very much a, a horror movie. And then there was obviously the, the delivery of the VHS tape again. And this time it was Bo talking to Uncle Howdy. But as the interview continued to progress, you could see they were kind of on the same page. And at the end, they were saying the same things, which linked them together and showed that like these alter egos were kind of merging into one. And that is kind of the goal of what they wanted to do originally. Like Bo and uncle Howdy had to become one. I almost like how the first vignette was where you had Bo and you had uncle Howdy. You have like, this is where he needs to be if he's going to honor his brother in the right, right way. And then you have Bo who is still, mourning the loss of his brother in many ways and that's kind of what the conversation is and that was a great dynamic where it makes you understand both sides both perspectives and then this week you saw where they almost like come together of the same mindset and the characters almost merge as one and even the way it was shot it was shot so so damn cool like the way at the very end they would fade 
you know, one guy out and you see one, and then the other guy came in, and then you see them together and you see teases of like, you know, the, the mask on Bo and you see, you know, different images and then they really come together as one and, and, and his goal has been accomplished. And I think that's probably where they're going to end the Bo Dallas, Uncle Howdy thing. That's, that's your explanation behind why Bo Dallas is like undertook this alias of Uncle Howdy and, and what he's going to do with it and his motivation for leading the Wyatt Six. I really liked the idea that Bo Dallas is being positioned in a way where he's going to be taken seriously because that was something that we've talked about. It's like, can Taylor step to that really difficult mantle that his brother once held? And the story that they're going with here is that people didn't look at Bo at the same level as Bray. So they're embracing that. And he's saying, we've been forgotten. We were discarded. We were never looked at on the same level as those other people. And now's the opportunity to show that they are at that. I think that's a really smart decision, Matt, because that gives an opportunity, a fresh opportunity for him to shed any of those past incarnations and be presented in a new light. I mean, I, I do too. And once again, it's just, uh, you know, it's evolution. And that's what all wrestling characters have to do. And they, they are evolving Bo Dallas into Uncle Howdy, and, and they were doing it in a very believable way. And the way they did it where he said, my brother was my hero. I wanted to be my brother. I want to do this. So he, like, sets the bar high for, like, what he wants to do and what he wants to achieve. And just his his facial expressions, his reactions, and, you know, how it, it's great that they took their time with this. The way they did it, I think this was the perfect setting to build him where – you're not doing it live in front of a crowd. You can have multiple takes if that's what they need to do or whatever, but it was done and it was practically perfect in every single way. And, and it added so much equity to him as like a player and it made him stand out as a leader of this group and it, and it just made people buy into him. So I am super happy for him. I love what he's done. And I think they have nailed this so far. Whoever is the, the, the ultimate brains behind this is doing a great job thus far. Last week, we talked about Jacob Fatu coming in and immediately made a big impact. They took out Paul Heyman, just absolutely destroyed him, in fact. And Paul had said that Solo was not the man he recognized as and acknowledged as the tribal chief. And they did away with Paul. It was a pretty visceral moment in the world's most famous arena where Paul Heyman has such a history with Madison Square Garden. So what a crazy segment to put out there to write Paul off for a little bit. And it certainly feels Matt like this might be the catalyst for a baby face Roman reigns to appear in the not so distant future. Do you think Roman's capable of rising to the occasion as top guy baby face after so many futile attempts in the past? Yes. I mean, he, he just got to do the same, same shtick he was doing before with the bloodline, except he's going to be positioned in the, uh, in the role of the hero. I mean, I, I don't even think he changes a whole lot. I just think you act the same way. You do the same deal. You get back the original crew. You know, you you put the Usos back together in there or what, whatever. You know, ho however it is, it is worked out. And now they just need to make sure to build up this new bloodline to make them seem like they are going to be a threat because Roman is a very high bar. So, you know, they really need to put as much steam as possible on this new version of the bloodline. And they really did. This thing with the taking out Paul Heyman was was epic and it, it's it felt big it felt special it felt important and kudos to paul Heyman for being willing to physically do that because he you know he put himself in some danger there as far as you know getting beat up and this thing through a table and whatnot but i, I just think uh i think the new bloodline especially since jacob fatu has joined has really got a ton of momentum and i think they can be threats and seem dangerous like they are the people that could stop roman reigns in the future and and that's that's what you need you need someone who seems like they are a very credible hill threat they can put an end to roman and then you need roman to overcome that and roman reigns when he comes back as a baby face presumably this is such a organic way of doing it think how long and how many opportunities there were to make roman a baby face and it just never really clicked we remember the rumble in 2015 when the fans openly rejected him in philadelphia and there were so many opportunities where it looked like they were going to try to get him there again, get him there again, and the fans just didn't embrace it. Why do you think the fans 
would hypothetically embrace it this time around? I mean, sometimes you just have to do a heel run to get that respect. I mean, that's that was always the deal with him. I would have loved to have seen Cena before. And once again, Vince was adamant because of the way he sold merch and, and uh, he was just so popular and he's a huge, you know, make a wish guy. I would have loved to have seen him adopt a heel role for a certain amount of time and then turn back into a baby face again, because ultimately whenever you do become a heel, all of the wrestling fans, especially the most loud and most vocal fans, you know, the people who stand out and really are the loudest who make the most noise, those people respect you more once you are willing to play the hill and you're willing to 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 get down and, and be dirty and not worry about if you want people to cheer you or not. And I, I feel like that is when the ultimate respect is gained. And typically, whenever a hill starts doing the thing and they're doing a good hill bit, that's when they get respected and people start getting into their character more than more 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 often than not. So yeah, I, I just think he's been so good. He was uh, so pivotal to WWE success, and he was so pivotal to bloodline and business becoming good again. And he did so well as a bad guy, as a heel, uh, he's going to kill it as a baby face. And he, he's going to be a baby face that can, you know, put the company on his back and, and carry it for a while. Over on the AEW side, I want to hit on this real quick here before we get into our episode. We had forbidden door this past week and uh, you and I have not had a chance to really talk about this show at all. However, I did say to you afterwards, I said, you got to go out of your way. You got to watch Will Ospreay. You got to watch Swerve. I know you're super high on both of those guys. You think Will Ospreay is one of the most talented performers in the world right now. What did you think of their match and the story they ended up telling there with Will Ospreay doing the honors for Swerve? I I, I thought I thought the match was great. I mean, I, I knew it was going to be great. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I got to watch it this morning while I was doing cardio. I thought the match was really, really good uh, as far as that goes. And it's something that was totally for the aw fan base um as far as the the big picture of things i i think it was great to have osprey who's the guy who's got all the momentum he's got like all the buzz right now uh have him have a match with swerve have swerve defeat him and really solidify himself as champion i thought that was great but i mean i i think more than anything else it was catering to the aw audience and it was a match they're they're gonna love and it was an, a, a truly amazing match it's interesting you say it's catering to the AW audience because I, I thought that was a match that would have translated across any company. I think you put that match in WWE with the quality of the story they told, it it translates extremely well to that. I think you put in TNA, it, it translates extremely well. It was, in, in my opinion, it was a great combination of a very clear story being told. They did a good build into telling you what that story was. Over the course of the match, you understood the story beats, and then the action was there where there was just some incredible feats of athleticism from both of them. And uh, you even got a little of the gaga with Don Callis and Prince Nana on the outside. I don't, why do you think it is that it, it just was more catered towards that audience? I, I just I, just because there wasn't as much of an entertainment aspect in it, just from their characters and, and their personas. I, I do agree. There is storytelling within them. There, 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 there is storytelling within, no doubt. And uh, it's one of the things, too, I'm, I'm kind of getting to that point, too, with like Will being so over. They, they've really got to address this thing. And I think they're going to do it sooner than later. Uh, the whole thing with Don Callis, because it's so weird with Don Callis being this guy who has all this heat and he's still part of the Don Callis family. But he is obviously such a baby face. Right. Because he is so beloved in many ways. Uh, it, it, I mean, it was it, it was a great match. It had an internal story. And I just I think AEW does a lot more. Their storytelling is is not. It is based more around the athleticism and kind of like the motivations interesting athletically for winning this than like the whole entertainment aspect is, is what, what that felt like to me as I watched it back. Interesting. Yeah, I couldn't disagree any more with you on, on that. This, I think that's one of the first times I really vehemently disagreed with you on, on how a match was this. The whole I think this was one of the most intricate storytelling main events that AEW has ever done, especially with the build. They had four weeks of build talking about their friendship and who'd be willing to go to that next level to put the other guy away, despite the respect that they had for each other. They've been telling this layered story with Will Ospreay not wanting to use the Tiger Driver, and he was willing to actually use it against his friend, but his friend was able to reverse it. They had some of the entertainy will he, won't he with the screwdriver. I don't know. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that take from you. Honestly. I know you enjoyed the match, and you're not disputing how, how the match was mm -hmm. good, but I, I don't know what sports entertainment-y thing you could have added to this that 
didn't check off the boxes of what this match delivered. I, I, I just, I think the, the bigger sports entertainment angles you had in AEW, I, I think Christian is the, the first and foremost is the one that has been going on the longest that I, that I've really dug. And I, was he even on, was he on the show? He was not. Cause I, I cause I, I didn't see everything. Um, but then like, you know, the, the, the bucks too, I feel like the bucks and the elite thing, they've kind of gotten away from them having the, the power as much in the show as, as it was. And I liked it when they were a, a little more heavy on that with them kind of like running the show, doing their heel shtick or whatever. Uh, and I, I did, I did get to watch their match as well. I, I enjoyed their match, but I just feel like when, and, and it's, it's the AEW branding right now. They're just, you know, they tell stories more involved inside the actual match and the competitors and the ath athleticism between the guys and whatnot, as opposed to like the bigger sports entertainment -y type stories. Yeah. I just thought that that match was built entirely on like a quality story put together over the course of four weeks about friendship and, you know, being willing to go to extra lengths to put your friend away. And they, I, I don't think they relied on who was the better athletic wrestler to carry that story i think they just had mat moves in the match that gave great physical presentation to it but then there was also you know the super sports entertainment -y build between tony storm and mina shirikawa with mariah may there and i thought they paid that off really well too yeah and th that that actually was and i should say that i i did not watch the match but i did see the clips and the finish of that and i that was a very sports entertainment -y story and yeah. i did enjoy that and actually I, I feel like that has been doing good too because it's got good traction i know that did some good yep. numbers right and mm -hmm. the segments and whatnot so no that 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 was and and i will so i i uh neglected to mention that before and that that has been really good and and yep. i i have enjoyed that there was a lot of chatter this week. I don't know if you saw this about the idea of Shane McMahon coming into AEW and people fantasy booking them with the Bucks and him being the higher power with the Bucks. You see a world where Shane O'Mac could end up showing up in AEW. He's not under contract with anyone currently. He's not. No, all that I I I heard from someone. I know none none of none of that was true. You so. think that's Matt Fiction? It's Matt Fiction, a hundred percent. Yeah. But what a world it would be, wouldn't it? It, it? I mean, it would be wild. It would be wild. <laughs> I, I just, I can't even, I mean, Tony openly commented on it and was like, yeah, you know, he's, yeah. He'd, he'd be an interesting addition. So I, Shane, Shane reached out to somebody and said like, why is all this talk of me and AW? Why is this going on? I just, people started like texting me about it, <laughs> reached out to someone and asked them that, okay. <laughs> which was interesting. Look at you with the scoops over here on the extreme life. How about that? Well, you mentioned Matt Fiction, so I got to ask you, Matt. It's Matt Fact time. Please hit us with that Matt Fact. Matt Fact. Matt is a permanent ice bath guy. I'm surprised you, you haven't gotten one of the tubs yet, have you? Like the dedicated tubs? No, not yet. It seems like that would be a good investment. It will be. It will be. I'm I'm actually still shopping around. There, there's a whole bunch out there, so I'm seeing which one is okay. ultimately the best that I want to do. So I'm doing doing some homework. I'm like shopping for grills and smokers, and you're like shopping for ice baths. One is more productive for the body than the other, but I'll give you lots of credit well, for, they're both, for doing they're, they're they're both pretty productive for the body if you <laughs> turn on some good turn on some good uh good protein. It's true. It's true. I saw you guys had some good hibachi this week. So yeah. So. It's always a good day at the office when you get that. All right, Matt, we are talking about WrestleMania 22 because that's when they used to do the Money in the Bank matches at WrestleMania rather than the Money in the Bank pay-per-views. And uh, this was the first Money in the Bank match that you were a part of because you were not around for the first one due to injury, if I'm not mistaken. But let's talk about the conceptualization of Money in the Bank in general. It comes into the equation ahead of WrestleMania 21. They claim it's an idea of Chris Jericho's where you have a bunch of people in this ladder match. You climb the ladder, whoever comes down with the briefcase. It was originally presented as a financial contract that you would cash in for a world title shot at any time. That has kind of changed a little bit over the years. But the first one is held at WrestleMania 21 and your friend of me, Adam Copeland Edge, wins it and ultimately leverages it to become the ultimate opportunist and 
become WWE champion. Uh, it would seem like a pretty innovative concept at the time. What did you think of it when we first saw it? Yes, John. It was a branch of the learning tree. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with that. Mm. Um, <laughs> now when your popularity points with the fans. I uh, I I love uh, I love when Jericho turns the voice on. Now it's a little tree. It's one of my favorite things because it's like him making fun of the the fans that hey, dislike him. <laughs> um, it, I I think it's a, it was an interesting idea at first. When I first heard about it, I was like, well, this is something. Uh, it's 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 a lot. Like this guy, so if you win this briefcase, you can just cash in at any time and win the title. It seems like a very unfair advantage, but I I, I like it and, and it and it fits like a hand in glove in pro wrestling because it is super sports entertainmenty and and I like that it you can elevate new hot guys and they can win a title even if it's someone who may not have like earned it or been super credible if they just like grab the championship and win it but it it, it, it gives you a, a point where you can take someone who's new who's hot who's on the rise and you can give them credibility by having them cash it in and win it and they don't even have to have it or, or keep it that long but it has become a a great tool that is it is able to elevate people and also like keep storylines fresh and also uh keep the unpredictability factor very high, which I love more than anything else in pro wrestling. Was there ever any talk of you being involved in the first one? Uh, no, the first, I, I was, I was out hurt during right. the first one. So that, that was, uh, that was before I was cleared to come back and work. So no but what I'm saying is like, there was no like, well, if Matt Hardy can get back in time kind of thing. I, I don't think so. The, the timetable would not have fit originally. So, uh yeah there, there there was not because it feels like it would have been a natural fit for you to be in that first one there, there were some interesting characters in it yeah no i mean it, it would have been i mean it, it's it's hard not to think about either hardy boy if you're talking about a ladder match just because we are so tied to ladder matches for infinity well you weren't really doing a lot of them once jeff left the company yeah, you were pretty much left to your own devices, and it, it was a pretty long time between ladder matches for you. I, I believe this one that we see here at WrestleMania was your first in a very long time. Or actually, I take that back. You had the one in 2005 on Raw. That would have been the first one you had in a very long time. But even so, it, it wasn't like you were so innate to it without Jeff because that was kind of your tag team identity. Yeah, that well, uh, also, too, there was a... Uh... I mean, there was a period there whenever I had turned heel and I was doing Matt Hardy version one, it was kind of not necessarily the extreme adrenaline junkie, the, the daredevil character. So I had kind of changed directions too. So that's probably why, you know, that wasn't something that would pop directly into people's minds. If they thought about booking me, they probably didn't think about booking me in a lot of match because I was doing something very different at that time. Do you remember there being any long-term plan for edge to win the world title because I think that's something that a lot of people wondered about creative at the time. Do, do they have a plan for the winner of money in the bank? Do they know that this person is going to cash in eight months down the line? I, when, I think when Adam first won, I, they didn't. They probably saw him as a guy they wanted to elevate into a world champion at some point. So I'm sure they, they wanted to do it, but I'm sure they didn't have a game plan, you know, and they were going to kind of pick their spots. But I would imagine now they probably have it figure it out mostly to the T, especially with Hunter behind things. I would say they probably have a great idea of when they're going to pull the trigger on these guys that win money in the bank matches. What do you think winning money in the bank did for edge? I mean, it, it really did. Once again, just whenever he won money in the bank, uh, it, it allowed him to be able to cash that in. It kind of set the precedent for like, kind of what, what, what does this money in the bank mean? If you win this match and you become the money in the bank, briefcase holder what, what does it mean uh and he kind of set the example it, it it he was the first so that's always a big deal that that always cements your name somewhere special and important if it's a concept that gets over and you were the first and then once again it allowed him to cash in and win the world title which once again elevates him and, and adds value to him money in the bank was part of wrestlemania for several years and then eventually it becomes its own pay-per-view where we're seeing two money in the bank matches on each show it started with raw and smackdown and then eventually it moved to men and women having each of them 
did you like the concept better with WrestleMania as a marquee match, or do you think that the stipulation is deserving of its own pay-per-view? I did I did enjoy it at WrestleMania. I thought it was good, but I understood also how it kind of outgrew even being part of WrestleMania. And and it is something as they want to do a, a pay-per-view every month or whatever to maximize the revenue. I understand it's it's a concept that kind of stands alone. And especially if you do a men's match and a women's match, then then it works. So I, I get what they do it. It makes total sense from business. Yeah, it's a little different too than like when they were doing TLC pay-per-views because those felt very forced, whereas money in the bank, here is the stipulation. You win this, you grab the briefcase, you've got the opportunity. That seems a little more in line with like the Royal Rumble per se and what kind of baseline it establishes there. Yeah, I mean, because there, there, there's uh <clears throat> there's stakes. You know, I know you said you're a big stakes person. It's just like if you are able to go and win this match, then there's these very important stakes that it it's a pretty good percentage. The percentage is higher, higher than lower that you will become the world champion when it's all said and done, especially if you look back over through the past and the, the past records of people who have won money in the bank, uh, you have a better chance of winning the the world title than, than not. So there, there are stakes and it's important. And it feels like if someone is winning, it is a, a moment where they're being elevated. And those, those are the moments that I think uh, WWE are really good at training fans to, to look forward to. But yeah, and why wouldn't you want stakes with your matches? You know, you you want people to care about having to see this match right now, having to watch this show, having to go to this show. The 2013 Money in the Bank pay per view. I went to that in person in Philadelphia, and it was my favorite. It was one of my favorite wrestling shows I've ever been to because it just felt so big being there. Because you knew what you were about to see would have importance for the rest of the year, and I think that separates it from a lot of the other events in that sense to the point where matt i truly believe money in the bank has kind of replaced survivor series in the big four wrestlemania SummerSlam, royal rumble and i personally think mm -hmm. money in the bank is there now what do you think about that interesting um i don't know uh i, I still think I still think Survivor Series is is very cool. I don't know if I would say it is uh, has replaced it in the the top four, but I would definitely see Money in the Bank being one of the more popular pay per views, especially because it's a ladder match, and I think people dig ladder matches. Um, sometimes people say they're overdone and whatnot, but I mean Money in the Bank obviously is uh, is destination viewing because you're going to be guaranteed two ladder matches, and they both have pretty important stakes. And these stakes are if your guy, if your guy or your girl are winning these matches, then it's going to be a, a a good year for them and there's going to be a lot of exciting segments coming up and i think it just adds to the unpredictability which i like more than anything else so to talk about this match we have to turn the clock back to around february or so of 2006 you have like a smorgasbord of tag team partners you're you're tagging with tonka you would tag with Bobby Lashley, but the one that's relevant to this story in particular is Road Warrior Animal, who you team with a few times against Eminem. Mm -hmm. How did the partnership with Road Warrior Animal come about here? Well, I was never supposed to initially team with Tatanka. It was uh, supposed to be me and Animal right from the jump. And if I'm not mistaken... The first time we were going to team was in Phil, it was in a uh, it was in Baltimore maybe it, it was a place that uh, Maryland, it, it was in Baltimore it was at the No Way Out pay per view it, that that's where myself and Tatanka team correct for the first time so yeah. it was supposed to be Animal then but his blood pressure was like off the charts and he couldn't pass the physical that's what ended up happening there so then it ended up being Tatanka he was like a last moment substitute because they 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 had this idea about doing myself and animal as a team for a little bit and like do a run so like two of the greatest tag teams of all time these guys joined forces and, and work together whatever but that didn't happen because uh his blood pressure was extremely high and they didn't pass him so he he wasn't cleared to to wrestle in maryland and uh it ended up being tatanka we went out and we did our thing eventually animal got things together and uh, his blood pressure was down and his health was okay, whatever he had to do. And and he came back and he teamed a little bit, but they, they, they decided pretty quickly that was going to be short lived. And they said they were going to have him 
flip on me and turn on me. And then they, they, they ended that very quickly too. Like, because I, I just think where, where they were with animal, they were just ready to move me into something a little different at that point. It's just so bizarre to me because less than a year prior, six months prior, you're involved in one of the biggest storylines in the entire company with edge. And now here we are, you're on the other brand. You're teaming with these weird offset tag team partners. What do you think led to that being the case for you? I mean, because I was in a rebuilding process because I had a deal where towards the end of that, where they told me to take care of myself, uh, you protect yourself, like don't put yourself in bad scenarios, like it, like kind of defy authority. If they say don't do that, you've got to be selfish. I was given that whole talk about the whole Top Guy thing. And then the thing with uh, Taker and Survivor Series where I was thrown in there. And then just because of that heat, I just kind of was reset. And whenever I went back to SmackDown, I just kind of started and I kind of had to work my way back up again. So that's why I ended up there. It was just the, the politics of pro wrestling at that point. For someone who was such a fan of tag team wrestling growing up and you were such a big Road Warriors fan, what was that like getting a team with him even for a little bit? I, I mean, that was cool. That, that, that was, that was really, really neat. It was, uh, it, it was fun to do. And it was one that I got to check off my bucket list, you know, just to, to, to team with a guy that you grew up with. Well, like anytime, like teaming with, with animals was, was super cool working with undertaker, working with stone cold. And like, Steve wasn't that much for, further ahead of me, but just like a guy who, you saw it was like a top guy, a huge major star. Just getting to work with those guys on the same level is something that is really cool. So teaming up with Road Warrior Animal, who was one of obviously our favorites as we grew up, was uh, was definitely very, very cool. On February 27, 2006, you and Road Warrior Animal face Eminem on SmackDown for the Tag Team Championship. You lose and eventually Animal turns on you at the end of this match and kickstarts a mini feud. You work a bunch of times on house shows, and he beats you on all of these house shows. It just seems very bizarre to me, especially if you were mentioning how they were kind of unsure about what to do with Animal. Why do you think that was? Uh, I, I, it, it just... It was irrelevant. I mean that that was the that was the view of uh, of events in those house shows. Like they just didn't really matter. So it was like you know whatever, one way or the other, um, just go out have a good match. And it's one of those things. Like I was so over still at that time, and I've kind of stayed like that. I'm almost Teflon, you know. So like whether I win or lose, it wouldn't make a huge difference. And like uh, you know, they're not releasing house show records and wins and losses on sure. house shows are irrelevant to them. So uh, I would imagine that's why. It does seem kind of bizarre, but on March 14th on SmackDown, you face Road Warrior Animal in a Money in the Bank qualifying match. He hits you with brass knucks and pins you one, two, three. He kind of sticks the knucks under his armpit and a little Nate goes to raise his arms and out come the brass knucks. They reverse the decision. He gets disqualified. You move on to Money in the Bank. Not exactly the most momentous win of your career, but it's a win nonetheless. What do you think of the execution of this? I uh, I think it was one of I think it was one of those where he was a little unsure of just like me beating him outright. And I think they kind of worked with him a little bit on doing that finish. But I I, I even think some of some of his concerns and the the worries he had about me beating him outright, I think that kind of led to what we ultimately did next because they kind of rolled with him on, on this scenario. And then the next time it was a, a, a pretty quick, pretty quick straight up finish. Interesting. What, what do you think he had an issue with? I just think there are some guys, especially guys from the old school who – are just in that mindset of they are who they are and you know, they have to be protected at all costs. I mean, that's kind of, that was the old school mentality of back in the day before people really accepted the concept that it is okay to lose, especially if it's in a good competitive match. And I would imagine he was one of the biggest monsters, him and Hawk and all of the business. So, you know, losing to a smaller guy who, you know, isn't the legend that he is. I'm sure that was something that he probably felt he had to protect himself about. 
Well, that would get us to Money in the Bank at WrestleMania a couple weeks later in Chicago. Do, do you have the results there of the, the next match that we had? Myself yes, and Animal. I do. I do. So you have the qualifying match that you win via DQ. Mm-hmm. On the March 25th house show, he beats you. Then on the March 26th house show, you beat him. Then after that, there's a match between you and Colt Cabana on Velocity after WrestleMania that he interferes with at the end. And you end up defeating him on SmackDown on April 11th in 17 seconds. Yeah. So that was the follow-up booking to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you can see with that, because I'm sure he had voiced those concerns. And on house shows, it didn't make a difference. If I was getting beat by him, it didn't change anything about me. So I would go out and I would have a match and I would get my stuff in. And at the end of the day, the crowd's still chanting Hardy, whether I win or lose. Um, I, I'll never forget, Arn Anderson was our agent for the 17-second match that you were talking about. And I remember Arn comes up and he said, oh, and he shoved, you know, pushes his glasses up. He goes, oh, well, Matthew. <laughs> Just kind of thinking about this. Uh, we're not doing anything else with this whole animal deal. So like, let's let's just put an end to this. Let's have him jump on you early, get in, and then once the bell rings, you turn around. There's a twist of fate. Let's let's get it over and done with. And then like I, he presented it to me first and told me kind of how he wanted to do it. And then Arn took me to to animal and we sat down and we talked. He said, "Well, I'm just thinking like jump on him early or let's do this." And you know, then all of a sudden he comes in and it's almost like you know he just he gets a quick one on you. Boom, with the twist of hate, and like, let's just get it done. And his explanation to him was a little different than it was to me, obviously, right? But it was one of those things where he said, This is what this is what the this is what the emperor wants. This is what the big this is what the big guy wants. And it came directly from Vince. He just wanted something in and out where it was like boom, like done with, and then we're finished. We're moving on and and no more of this. And I, I think they were kind of done with animal at, at that time as far as like utilizing him on TV. Yeah, he didn't last a whole lot longer that year so that track doesn't work for me brother didn't exactly work for him yeah i mean so. it just it is what it is and I, I just i mean i knew i was going to be okay regardless you know so i just i would just roll with the punches and obviously it turned out all right when it was all said and done well it does get you to money in the bank and this wrestlemania 22 match in chicago so how about we do our first watch along in some time here matt you ready sure let's do it Okay, Matt, so we are at WrestleMania 22 in Chicago, and this is a a pretty big WrestleMania for WWE, Right, John Cena versus Triple H, Shawn Michaels versus Vince McMahon in their no-holds-barred match, Mickey James and Trish Stratus, Edge and McFoley. It's a very memorable show, and uh, you guys are on second on the main card. This is... Bobby Lashley, yourself, Finley, mm-hmm. Ric Flair, Sheldon Benjamin, and RVD in Chicago for Money in the Bank. Um, before we hit play here, Ric Flair being in a Money in the Bank match, to quote your pal Hurricane, what's up with that? Uh, I, I loved it. And, and, and I remember the t- uh, TV or so before this. Once Rick knew he was going to be in this, I remember he shot me a text and said, "Hey, can I can I talk to you?" It was at a TV, and then uh, we met up and we talked. He's like, "Hey, I'm going to tell you this. Like, I've done one of these with Edge, like you and Edge. I know you're the architects of these things. You know, you you got the mind for it, and uh, you're 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 the only guy I really trust in there. So, I want someone to suplex me off the top of the ladder." And, and it's got to be you because you're the only one I trust. I know you've done this. You 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 created this whole ladder match nonsense, this insanity. So, like, I want this to hold up for my legacy. So I want you to do this. He said, are you cool with that? And I said, of course. And I just, that was a huge compliment, you know, coming from Ric Flair that he said, I've done one with, you know, Adam, which obviously you'd seen before, which uh, that was one that they'd done a little earlier. And that was in 2005-ish, I want to yeah, say. Yeah, they, they, uh, they did that on Raw. On- yeah. Uh, I, it it might have even been after he cashed in. I can't remember. It, it was it was it was a TLC match. I, it, it was. I think it was after he ca- it was after he cashed in. I think. Um, but you know, he said like you know, I just you know, I just trusted him and I was able to listen to him. And I know who you you know you and you and Adam, you're the architects. And and Christian Jay wasn't here then. He was off in TNA at this time. And uh, I said, yeah, of course, Rick. And it was one of those things. Like he was in there. He said, just 
the whole while we were kind of talking about this match or putting the blueprint of this match together, he would like come over to me. So, Oh, should, should I do it this way? Should I do it like that? And it was so great because he was like leaning on me for being one of the ladder match experts, so to say. Um, but yeah, I was very happy to do that. And, and whenever we get to the spot where I'm going to suplex him off, I'll, I'll give you some of the details he was saying in very, very much classic Rick, Rick Flair style. Well, we are going to start this on our watch along here. Uh, if you're, if you want to follow along on Peacock, you can queue up the cock and queue up uh, the we, cock. We, we have just finished the intros and they're about to ring the bell. We're going to get to this in three, two, one. Here we go. It just showed a shot of Matt. So if that's where you're looking time code wise, let's do this here. A unique cast and crew for this match, Matt. Yeah, it, it is a, a, a unique cast and crew. All really good guys, though. All guys who, who are over at this time. Uh, there's there's guys who are talented, who are uh, you know, kind of ladder match guys, uh, extreme match guys, DQ matches. You know, talking about myself and uh, RBD. Who there's one other person that I think I'm missing here. But uh, Sean Benjamin. Sean Benjamin, yes. Yep. And it, you know, then you have a couple of legends and Fit Finley and and Ric Flair, and then you have a powerhouse and Bobby Lashley. So it is an interesting combination. And in theory, a couple of these guys could have won here. You know, Ar RVD was super hot at the time. Yeah. So I think he was definitely the favorite going into it. But you had been involved in a huge feud. You know, Sheldon Benjamin was always someone that it's like he could be the next guy. Bobby Lashley, they were pushing super hard at the time. That makes the match even better, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when when uh, when you look at all of the competitors in a Money in the Bank match, and and it's hard to really put your finger on one person who's going to win. That's that's the best case scenario. When things are unpredictable, pro wrestling's at its best. And plus, this is in Chicago, one of the hottest crowds you're going to face all year. What, did you feel like you guys had them here? Yeah, it was it was really good. I remember this was a cool setup because it had uh, like the the roster, everybody on WrestleMania. Their little banner was all around the building, which was a, a real cool setup, and and the crowd was great. It was in the the Rosemont, you know the uh, Alba, the Rosemont Arena, so the crowd was red hot. They were like on top of you, and that's just one of the hottest crowds ever. It's one of the best buildings, best venues that WWE would go to. So yeah, they they were great during this. We just saw Shell and Benjamin do a, a reprise of his spot from. The previous year's Money in the Bank match, where he set the ladder up and he ran up it, uh, did a did a dive off it this time. Just, I'd have to imagine, Matt, he's probably one of the freakiest athletes you've ever been in the ring with, right? Yeah, I mean, he, he's he's definitely a very very special athlete, one of the best athletes I've ever been in the ring with. I mean, you you're in there and you're wrestling him. He's just one of those guys. He feels real, you know, being an amateur wrestling champion and whatnot. He 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 feels real. There's you and Nate climbing and the ladder. And like we we get here and we'd like talked about where I was going to go. And like right here when I start hitting Rick, Rick says higher, higher, higher. <laughs> there higher. you go. Yeah, and I did. You can see that I climbed up another. Because we talked about kind of like what rung I was going to suplex him with. Because I, I wanted to make sure that he landed in plenty of room and didn't land with his legs all tied up in the ropes and land on his head or whatever. But he was just higher, higher. I remember he was so commanding as he was saying that. I was like, okay, we got it. It's all good. And then I just tried to drop down as tight as I could because still, like, you know, if you're superplexing someone off a ladder, it's uh, still, it's uh, you have to stick in tight, not to like crash and get all caught up in the ropes. So interesting little angle they're doing here. This, this is meant to take Rick out of the match. The referees immediately threw up the X doctors at ringside. Was this just to minimize how much work Rick actually had to do in this and bump around at his age? Uh, I, I don't think that was the reason. I, I think they did it for drama to really make people think that Rick maybe was going to win, that whenever he comes back, there's a real close uh, false finish of him winning. I think that that was the reason why, because Rick, Rick was ready to go. I mean, he was that uh, suplex. People were talking about, oh, my God, how'd you do this? Rick Flair was 50, whatever years old. <laughs> you know, he, he was he was fine. I mean, he's been incredible you know he would take that top rope body slam off the ropes every single night you know whenever he was working on the road 300 nights a year um but yeah it wasn't to like minimize what he was going to do in the ring i think they were just trying to hope for a, a strong false finish that rick was going to come back and and maybe even win the match yeah just make a moment out of it yeah yeah they were they were definitely trying to make a moment out of it for sure i got you i got you where do you feel bobby lashley was at this time in his career I, I mean, it was one of those things. I, I thought 
I mean, Bobby, I've just always had such a great respect for him as an athlete because he's just such a freak of nature, right? And and on top of that, not only is he extremely intimidating looking, but I mean, he's strong, he's a powerhouse, he's fast, he's agile. I mean, he's just such a gifted athlete in every capacity. I just, uh, I felt like here, you know, once again, he was just trying to figure out what his personality was going to be. I think he was really just trying to to figure out what was going to make Bobby Lashley work as a character in many ways. I think that's kind of where he was at right here. Yeah. That was the spot I liked a lot where, you know, Shelton went over and he wasn't quite strong enough to pull off the, the juggernaut Bobby Lashley on his own and myself and fifth only assisted him. That was a, a cool spot. Did you have a lot of input in putting this match together? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. We sat down and I had a lot of different ideas and I, I think the secret to these ladder matches is like so much has been done now in ladder matches. Like almost everything has been done. You just got to kind of approach things from a different angle and just try and put a little bit of a different or original spin on, on uh, things that maybe have been done before. Here you are teeing off a little bit. I was going to say, I can't imagine a ladder match is super even familiar to a guy like fit Finley either. Yeah, fit, 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 fit was the best man. He he was just so good, such a great attitude, and so, I'm so, you know, so glad I got the opportunity to work with him so much. Fit is just like one of the best ever, and he's one of the best teachers. He was just so cool, calm, and collective. Uh, I, I feel like his his coolness, his calmness, and his collectiveness. I, I feel like that probably inspired some of mine that I do nowadays. When people like. There's times where I'm working with people and they're like, oh, my God, I was down at just how calm you were and some of the things you said or whatever else. But, I mean, Fit was like the ultimate cool as a cucumber guy whenever you would go work with him. I mean, there's times where we would be on house shows and I would come in and my name was on the sheet to wrestle against Fit Finley. And he just, OK, just call it out there. I was like, yeah, sounds good. You know, and we do that on house shows all the time. And I, I love that. Here comes Rick. Yeah. Pretty quickly, too. Didn't even waste too much time. But I don't think yeah. this match actually was it, given a ton of time. It didn't. It, 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 it There wasn't a ton of time. So it was one of those things that was kind of in and out. I remember there's going to be a point here where, like, I'm trying to – I'm begging Rick to, like, start chopping me, like, because he's firing a first comeback or whatever. I'm just trying to, to get his attention. We'll see how this shows up. If my memory serves me correct, here it I is like, where it is. I like this, though, because it's like you were the guy that took him out and you're the first guy that he goes after. Yeah. Yeah, it's right here. I, I think right here you can see where like, I'm trying to grab him, trying to grab him. And he's like just working over Shelton. And then finally he gets back on me. Take Shelton we're like, come out. on, Rick. If we're going to do this and we're going to tease your winning, like fire up, man. Kick everybody's ass. Look at all the flash bulbs. They want to see Ric Flair win money in the bank. Yeah. Yeah, th this is this this moment is what we were looking for, I think. And then it ends with the shillelagh. <sighs> That's not a fun bump to take either. Yeah, that's a, a tough bump once again. And that's a bump that he didn't have to take. He, he voluntarily took that. He could have, like, taken that and fell to his feet like he was knocked unconscious. Look look at Finley hitting the briefcase so he can elongate the moment more and give Benjamin yeah. more, more time to climb. It's those small little things you kind of have to do. It's amazing how difficult it is to climb a ladder when you have to, right? Uh, sometimes, yeah, it definitely is in these matches and you never know. And just sometimes the, the, the pace changes very quickly, very rapidly. Oof. And Bobby Lashley still looks the same. He does. Yeah. He's never aged. Mm. He does. He does look absolutely the same. He looks like the same size. He looks so similar, you know, especially since. He's just been bald the whole while. It's crazy. <laughs> him and him and him and Truth, man. They 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 really ever they don't time. age. Yeah, Truth is crazy. You're, you drank from the fountain of youth, man. All right, here we go, Bobby Lashley. I'm actually surprised by how little of Rob Van Dam we've seen in this match. There he is. Yeah, he's coming. And it was one of those things too. I mean, th th this was uh, this was one of the more easy money in the banks, uh, to the best of my recollection, because like it wasn't that long, um, you know. And just if you kind of space things the right way, then you don't have to do a do a ton of things. This was a very easy match to perform in. I don't think one performer has really had more face time than anyone else per se. 
Yeah, I mean, and that, that's always our, our goal when doing this. We're, we're trying to set things up where everybody, you know, we want everybody to have a moment, which makes them stand out. You know, I'm getting one of my moments here, I would guess. But that is kind of the uh, the goal of these things. How'd that one feel? Yeah, uh, that one wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't off the top of the cage in Oklahoma City. So it wasn't too bad. And you have to do these falsy spots here where everyone conceivably has a chance to win the match, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the whole purpose of this thing. I mean, it's in these matches, you have to be very careful about like even that leg drop there, like, you know, just being able to jump off the ladder as opposed to like trying to win the match. You have to remember the, the goal is to, to win the match in this deal. There was even a small detail there. They had a tight shot on you and it looked like it was just you there. And then Finley came yeah. out of nowhere. So telling the home audience that, Hey, uh, here, here's a chance for Matt to win a side effect mm-hmm. off the ladder. Crowds up for that. And this is almost kind of like a double down in a way. Yeah, that, that was a, that was a, a good fit spot. I want to feel, uh, I feel like that was, that was maybe the spot that was going to take him out. Usually towards these things, everyone looks for a spot that is ultimately going to take them out. I, I guess it would be this in the five star frog splash <laughs> off the ladder. What a camera shot. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh, Hey, Rob just had that very special connection with the fans that Jeff had, you know? He, he does. I mean, Rob, Rob really does have a very, very unique connection with the fans. Just saw him a couple weeks ago in Jackson, Mississippi, man. And oh, it's great seeing him. He's got a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Rob's a, Rob's a cool cat, man. He, he is very reminiscent of Jeff as he's just like his own dude. Like he's kind of just, you know, he he's, he's in his own universe. He's in his own dimension in many ways. <laughs> Rob was cool as shit for me as a kid, man. Great theme song, too. Mm-hmm. I was all about that. Here he is climbing. Is this going to be it? Rob going to win money in the bank here? I think you're up. Oh, look at that. Sean Benjamin. Out. This, I will say, Matt, this is shot yeah. very well. Yeah. You did not see that coming. No, that was shot very well. The springboard onto the ladder. And here you come trying to sneak a win away. I've seen this spot, Matt Hardy, before. When you're positioned there, I think that usually doesn't end too well for you. Uh oh. They usually don't. If there's six people in it, it's only going to end well for one of them. The the other five are gonna are gonna eat it. And yikes! Oh, there we go. How that one feel? It wasn't bad. This this match was this was one of the easier money in the bank matches. I, well, no, nothing was bad in it. Rob wins money in the bank, takes the Jeff Hardy bump down. And there yeah, you have yeah. it. He is Mr. Money in the Bank. What do you think watching it back, man? Good stuff. Yeah, I, I haven't watched that in, in quite a while, but uh I liked it. It was good. Very simple, very to the point. And uh I I like the fact that we did that. We had three guys in it uh, up at the top of the ladder at the very end. It seems like any guy could have won it of those three. And then ultimately Rob, Rob gets the Duke and gets the W. I dug it a lot, man. I thought it was a, a strong ladder match that a lot of young people could learn from into how to put together a concise ladder match that doesn't take up a ton of time and still showcases everyone, which I'd have to imagine is probably the biggest challenge with something like that. Yes. Yes, indeed. So you guys come out of that and Rob wins money in the bank. And as we know, he would cash in money in the bank at ECW one night stand and defeat John Cena. What a, that's- yeah, that's a hell of a night, man. And just one of those things where the fans were just going nuts. Just one of those classic memories that like, uh, is just, just so unique to watch and, and be a part of. Yeah. That was Maybe a, a that's very something cool we'll get a chance to cover in long form here on the podcast because Rob is certainly someone who I'm sure you've got some great stories about. But good stuff, man. Really enjoyed that. Excited for Money in the Bank this weekend with WWE up in Toronto. Should be a very fun show. Uh, anything else you want to add here, man? Uh, no, that was fun. It was fun watching that back and enjoying these ladder matches. Looking forward to a, a ladder match before too long here in TNA with the Hardys. Uh, it's going to be a going to be something that we're going to want to do without a doubt so we uh we're very excited to to get a shot at the uh the the tag team titles of the world 
And then uh, maybe once we win them, we'll put them up in the line. We'll hang them up and have a have a crazy have a crazy uh, tag team ladder match. And the new expedition begins. Who the new is expedition the begins. Who what knows? could happen? We want you on board with us here at the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Head on over to advertisewithhardy.com. Get your business, get your product out in front of thousands of listeners and viewers every single week. Promote your business to the extreme. And don't forget to check us out hardyboyslive.com that's with a z a night with the hardy it's the hardy party at 90s wrestling con in atlantic city saturday july 13th at 6 p.m at acx1 studios at the pier at caesars tickets are 60 dollars. it's going to be a fantastic time an extreme life of matt hardy podcast a jeff hardy acoustic concert that is what you want down on the shore there's nothing quite like the jersey shore matt hardy because we don't pump gas we pump our fists instead. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying, yes. Matt Cardona, maybe he'll pop up. He's always ready. That'd be good. That'd be good. <laughs> That'd be good. This has been a good episode of The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. The words have been spoken. We'll see you next time right here on The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. <laughs> Dilly! SaveWithConrad.com. My name is Doug Gustafson, and we are from Columbus, Ohio. First learned of Conrad through his podcast network. I'm a big 83 Weeks fan. Probably got into a little bit more credit card debt than what we wanted to uh, during the course of the pandemic. We wanted to get rid of some of that. My wife and I had uh, luckily bought the house many years ago and had quite a bit of equity built up in it. We are looking to actually redo our bathroom, things around the house that we wanted to do with the other equity that we have left over. We had been talking about refinancing forever, and I finally just took the plunge and called the number, got a hold of him, and from start to finish, it was it was just fantastic. I had Diane within the day. The, the communication with her was, was fantastic. The process moved quicker than I could have ever hoped. My name's Doug Gustafson from Columbus, Ohio. I ended up saving $800 a month with Save with Conrad and am able to also update our bathroom. NMLS number 32416, Equal Housing Lender, savewithconrad.com.